It is still largely unknown just how colossal the great city of Ur could have once been. Ur, once the most important Sumerian city-state in ancient Mesopotamia, around 3rd millennium BC, is where the remains of the great ziggurat lay. And just as with the ancient city, only the foundations of this once enormous pyramid still exist today. Just how big this pyramid once was is now left to the imagination, although one could calculate the structure's original possible size based on the ascent angle of many other ancient pyramidal structures from around the world. A range between 48 to 53 degrees would be a very safe benchmark to use, which would have made this once complete structure located on the Daikar province in South Iraq an awe-inspiring sight. Yet what must be the most interesting of details regarding this very ancient structure, characteristics of which make this building stand out as obviously a very important piece of the puzzle regarding the pyramids, has to undoubtedly be the living quarters which were actually built into the pyramid for the use of an ancient alien, a god, who apparently came from the sky. Before delving into the details of which I feel it is important to point out, our previous video covering Mario Bildrip's compelling work, collaborative data which correlates over 500 ancient structures on Earth to past cardinal reference points or North Pole locations from over half a million years ago. Interestingly, he singles out the great ziggurat among others. In particular, the Sphinx as noticeably the most ancient of monuments that he has correlated on Earth. If his work becomes peer-reviewed, it would, along with numerous other research projects, strongly suggest certain monuments on Earth have survived several ice ages, the city of Ur's pyramid being but one of these ancient sites. Regardless of Mario's compelling work, historical facts surrounding this ancient alien god, who is said to have resided within this great pyramid within Iraq, has already been translated and thus well established on many occasions. The Great Ziggurat consists of successive platforms which have a solid core of mud brick, which was then covered by burnt bricks. This outer layer is said to have protected the core from the elements. The mainstream archaeological and historical understanding of the construction is that it began under King Ur-Namu of the 3rd dynasty of Ur, around the 21st century BC, and was completed by his son, King Shulgi. The Great Ziggurat of Ur was located in the temple complex of the city-state, which was the administrative heart of Ur. Although we would postulate, just like the ancient Egyptian cities, which also build up around these monumental and mysterious structures, were merely modern colonizations of sites which were far older. It is a well-known fact that many cities, towns, villages, and indeed temples are often rebuilt, reconstructed upon much older foundations. It is a common mistake to perceive a historical understanding's beginning, which occurred at a certain point within history, as that of the site's creation. Many sites all over the world are far older than that of the academic records made upon said subjects. The great ziggurat of Ur is largely accepted as having been dedicated to the moon god Nana, who is the patron deity of the city. It is interesting that Nana is a very ancient deity indeed. And of course, in all possibility, was once a very real entity, an ancient alien who visited Earth and attributed as a god. It is likely that this occurred at night, thus making him or her a moon god. Why, for example, would you create a monumentally sized building in the dedication of this god, with a throne which rested upon the top overlooking the city? Why would one feel the requirement to build living quarters into the temple? a bedchamber complete with furnishing. Why would one completely build the structure around the living need of an imaginary giant, if one was never intending on using it? Nana has turned up in mythology from cultures throughout the world over the ages. And this, of course, may have been for good reason. She also appears in Norse mythology in the 6th century, thus having been connected by some scholars with the Sumerian goddess Inanna, the goddess Babylonian Ishtar, or the Phrygian goddess Nana, mother of the god Attis. Scholar Rudolf Simek opines that identification with Inanna, Nanar, or Nana is hardly likely, due to the large distances in time and location between the figures. Yet, alas, this form of conclusion 
based on academic paradigm rather than a sheer possibility, is a very dangerous mindset indeed. Scholar Hilda Ellis Davidson says that while the idea of a link with Sumerian Inanna, Lady of Heaven, was attractive to early scholars, the notion seems unlikely. Though she too lacks a compelling argument for her conclusion, we find the notion of scholars, assuming, to be a dangerous scenario for the rest of humanity, and we perceive such attitude as an attack on open critical thought. We do, however, find the facts surrounding the possible past existence of Nana, along with the theories surrounding the true antiquity of this one enormous structure, to be highly compelling. It is largely accepted within mainstream archaeology that modern civilization started with Iraq, within what we now call Mesopotamia. Iraq is currently accepted as the longest surviving continuous area of civilization anywhere on Earth. The question is, how did this very ancient culture excel so successfully within their surrounding environment? How did they develop such sophisticated methods of survival at such a primitive time in our history? There actually exists a series of figurines made by unknown people that predated the Sumerian culture by some magnitude, known as the Ubadian people. Were these the source of Sumerian wisdom? The only problem is that the figures are representative of a race of reptilians, a discovery at the Al Ubaid archaeological site where many very ancient artifacts were found, depicting humanoid figures with lizard characteristics. The origins of the Ubadian people is unknown. Their entire existence is a huge mystery to mainstream history, and although this race of people may in all possibility be the pioneers for modern civilization, very little is known about them. They apparently lived in large village settlements within mud brick houses. They developed architecture, agriculture, and farmed the land using irrigation. Their domestic architecture involved large houses, open courtyards, paved streets, even food processing equipment. Some of these villages began to develop into towns, temples began to appear, as well as monumental buildings, such as in Eridu, Ur, and Uruk, once the capitals of the Sumerian civilization. Many of the figurines exhibit different postures, and in most cases they appear to be wearing a curious helmet of some kind, and have some form of padding around the shoulders. Other figurines were found to be holding staffs, or a scepter, possibly as a symbol of their status amongst the group. Each figurine was clearly intended to represent a unique individual. Some female figurines were even discovered holding babies, with the child also represented as a reptilian creature. Just who were the Obadian people? Were these figures intended to represent tribe members? More research into their appearance and information surrounding the origins of their knowledge is clearly needed. We will of course keep you posted on any future developments regarding this mysterious, valuable and quite possibly reptilian tribe. In 1835, an unknown laborer in Kent, the UK, was doing his usual field work. When he struck the soil in what could be classified as a lucky spot, upon impacting the ground, his spade disappeared into the earth, breaking a doorway into an underworld like no other. The lad soon realized that he was standing on an entrance to hollow underground caverns that from the surface could not be seen. Word quickly spread regarding the find and the curiosity to see what was actually down there soon began to boil over. A local school teacher kindly volunteers his young son Joshua to make the dangerous trip down beneath the ground to see what was actually down there. He described rooms encrusted with millions of carefully arranged shells. People were obviously a little skeptical regarding the claims initially. Yet when the hole was eventually widened, allowing to see for themselves, they were stunned when the boys' accounts were confirmed as completely true. Now known as the Shell Grotto of Margate, its origins or purpose still remains a complete mystery to this day. Almost all the surface area of the walls and roof are covered in mosaics created entirely out of seashells, totaling about 190 square meters of mosaic, calculated to be around 4.6 million shells. Various hypotheses have dated its construction to any time in the past 3,000 years. Theories have included that it was an 18th or 19th century rich man's folly 
that it was a prehistoric astronomical calendar, and even that it could be connected to the Knights Templar. Interestingly, no publicly known scientific dating of the site has yet to be completed. The most frequently used shells throughout the mosaic, mussels, cockles, whelks, limpets, scallops, and oysters are largely local. They could have been found in sufficient numbers from four possible bays, yet the majority of the mosaic is formed from the flatwinkle, which is used to create the background infill between the designs. However, this shell is found only rarely locally, so would have been collected from shores west of Southampton. Shell Grotto is certainly an amazing, yet not very well-known find. More scientific research is clearly needed if we are to unravel the mysteries of its incredible construction.